All right, uh, good morning. Well, uh, let me begin by thanking the organizers for the kind invitation. It's wonderful to be back to KTP, and uh, I really enjoyed the, the conference, a lot of very interesting talks. Uh, so I'd like to tell you um, about uh, some progress uh, in the last couple of years uh, on the uh, topic of boundary and defect criticality. So over the last several decades, we've learned that if you take a quantum system, um, a lot of interesting phenomena can happen on the boundary. And in particular, um, if you have a topological um, gapped bulk, it often um, supports protected boundary uh, modes. And a lot of us in the audience have worked on the precise relation between the bulk gapped phase and uh, the uh, constraints on the, on the boundary. Okay, um, now in the case when the bulk is gapped, these relations are understood very well, uh, but what about the case when the bulk is gapless, when the bulk is critical? Well, this turns out to be a much more uh, difficult problem that uh, takes us into the realm of boundary conformal field theory, at least when the bulk is described by conformal field theory. And uh, in this case, uh, I'll show you that even for some of the simplest classical uh, critical bulk states, uh, they're still in, the, in progress of uh, understanding such basic features as the boundary phase diagram. So this is as far as uh, boundary phenomena is concerned, uh, you know, um, also of interest um, is defect, uh, are defects in quantum systems, and you know, a, um, kind of a paradigmal problem is the problem of a quantum impurity uh, in, a, in a critical uh, bulk state, and a, par a paradigmal example is the condom model. Uh, but uh, you know, other ways that uh, defects appear um, in the study of uh, quantum systems is, uh, for instance, uh, if you want to look at entanglement properties, uh, compute um, entanglement um, quantifiers such as um, uh, the entanglement entropy and the Rayleigh really entropy, as was already discussed uh, uh, in this conference. Uh, what you have to do is you have to look at a kind of entangling surface, which in the space-time path integral maps to a, a co-dimension two defect. Um, so again, the, if the bulk is critical, this maps to some kind of a defect, defect theory. So we'd like to also understand such uh, defects in critical bulk states. Okay, so you know, I kind of uh, introduced this in the quantum context, but actually most of my talk is going to be about uh, just classical critical systems, and in fact uh, about perhaps the simplest uh, Critical, uh, critical model in statistical mechanics, the classical ON model, uh, in three uh, bulk spatial dimensions. Uh, so, um, the, just to remind you, um, so says the notation, so I'm studying a classical uh, Hamiltonian um, of classical spins. So classical spins are just N component unit vectors um, coupled here uh, with a nearest neighbor coupling um, and uh, taken to be ferromagnetic. And uh, I'd like to think about, um, let, let, let's say, a cubic lattice in the presence of a boundary. Uh, so I'd like to, uh, to study the physics near the boundary, and I'm going to allow for the boundary coupling uh, between the spins K1 to be different from the bulk coupling K. So I want to study the phase diagram of this uh, model as a function of temperature and the ratio of the surface coupling to bulk coupling. A very, very old problem, you know, has been studied at least since the 70s, but uh, as I'll try to, um, to demonstrate, uh, some very basic um, aspects of it have been missed. Okay, so let's begin with the simplest case, uh, 3D easing model, um, right? So we know that there is a bulk uh, phase transition, bulk critical temperature, and I want to understand what happens uh, near the boundary as I cross the bulk 
critical temperature. Well, uh, uh, that depends on the value of the surface coupling. If the surface coupling is not too large, then uh, the surface will order at the same temperature as the bulk. This is known as the ordinary boundary universality class. It's described by a boundary conformal field theory. And uh, if I look at the spin-spin correlation on the boundary at the bulk critical temperature along this blue line, then I see Paolo uh, correlations with an exponent which is known approximately from Monte Carlo simulations, epsilon expansion, uh, bootstrap, um, and so forth. Uh, okay, so that's the ordinary boundary universality class. Now if I uh, crank up my uh, surface coupling K1 to be large, to be you know, much larger than the bulk coupling, then uh, I expect that as I lower the temperature, the surface will order before the bulk does, right? You know, in two dimensions, um, a discrete symmetry can be spontaneously broken, so we'll have this phase transition here in green, which is just a purely surface phase transition in the 2D easing universality class. So I go then uh, to this phase where the surface is already ordered and the bulk uh, is still uh, paramagnetic. As I keep lowering the temperature, uh, I'm going to hit the bulk critical temperature, and uh, so I now ask, how does the bulk order in the presence of this already ordered boundary? So this is known as the extraordinary boundary uh, universality class. And again, all the names are historical, so we just stick with them. And here, um, you know, it's again described by, in this case of the easing model, by a boundary conformal field theory. Um, and in this case, the spin-spin correlation function on the boundary uh, well, goes to a constant at large separation because the boundary is already ordered, but then there are some subleading corrections, and, uh, which are universal, and the leading one of this, uh, the case with a power of six. Um, okay, so that's the extraordinary uh, boundary universality class. And finally, there is this multicritical point, the special boundary universality class. And um, here it's again yet another uh, boundary conformal uh, field theory. Uh, with another set of uh, critical exponents. Um, uh, um, right. So, uh, you know, loosely speaking, if you are working in 4 minus epsilon dimensions, you can think of this ordinary universality class as a um, Dirichlet boundary condition and this special uh, universality class as a Neumann boundary condition for the bulk or the parameter. Okay, so this is the easing model case. And uh, this physics has been understood for a long time. There is nothing new uh, I'm going to say here. When we take the xy model, so n equal to 2, uh, the physics becomes uh, more interesting. So here, you know, the layout of the phase diagram is the same, but this phase here doesn't have long-range uh, surface order, only has quasi-long-range uh, surface order, right? Because in two dimensions, we know that um, xy spins can only have quasi-long-range order. So this green line is a purely surface phase transition in the two-dimensional costless tauless universality class. And uh, here in this phase, I have Paolo uh, correlations on the boundary. So now we ask the question, as we hit the bulk critical temperature, uh, what happens on the boundary? And it turns out that this question has not been answered in the literature. So uh, the only detailed discussion of it that I could find was in this uh, Monte Carlo study um, in 2005. And uh, several interpretations of the Monte Carlo data were suggested, one of which was that perhaps um, right at the bulk critical temperature, the boundary has long range order, which would mean that the boundary order parameter presumably has a jump across the bulk uh, critical temperature. So this uh, actually raises a more fundamental question. You know, we know that by Merman-Wagner theorem, in two dimensions, strictly in two dimensions, with local interactions, you cannot have a spontaneous breaking of a continuous symmetry. But if your two-dimensional system is sitting on the surface of a critical bulk, can you have a spontaneous breaking of a continuous symmetry? Right? This is some kind of very basic question. Um, and, you know, one of the interpretations of the data 
here was that yes, you can. And you know why? Why you might you believe that uh, it might be possible? Well, you know that if you take a strictly two-dimensional system, but not with local interactions, but with polar interactions, then if the uh, interactions decay slowly enough, then actually we know very well that uh, uh, long-range order uh, for a continuous symmetry can exist at a low enough temperature. So does this happen for the for the problem we are considering here? Well, it turns out that uh, no, it does not. Uh, you don't get long-range order on the surface at the bulk critical temperature, but you get very close. So in fact, what I showed is that um, if you sit along this orange line and look at the spin-spin correlation function on the boundary, it decays as a power of the logarithm of uh, separation, and this power is universal. So the spin-spin correlation function does go to zero at large separation, but it goes to zero extremely slowly, and this, uh, you know, explains why in the early numerics, or, well, these numerics, uh, it was misinterpreted as long-range order on the boundary. Yes? Suppose I leave the carbon box here, and I see one kind of interaction generated on the boundary. What's that this one outcome? I don't What's the corresponding? Outcome. Well, I'm not sure this is a... Uh, good procedure. I, I'll tell you how to treat this problem later. So basically, um, turns out that when the boundary is about to order, has strong short-range order, it has a very profound effect on the bulk uh, in, in, in the sense that it basically acts as a pinning field for the bulk. So kind of the naive integration out is not, uh, is not the procedure that you, that you want to, to do. You don't want to start kind of with Dirichlet boundary conditions. You want to start with this pinned boundary condition as your starting point. Uh, good question. So if you take a um, if you take a free theory, just let, let's model the bulk as free. Oh, well, okay, it depends depends also on the, what kind of boundary conditions you take. Neumann or, or Dirichlet. Uh, so if you take Dirichlet, then you probably get one of R cubed or something. Uh, yeah, but I think again this is uh, this is kind of an irrelevant question. Yes, Leo. You see, Uh, at the bulk. Well, so so I'm I'm only showing here the correlation functions on the boundary, but you could also ask uh, uh, about the correlation functions in the bulk. So there is some you know in there is there is some crossover from the bulk critical behavior to the boundary critical behavior. In the so so <laughs> it depends on the distance to the boundary and the distance along the boundary. And for a, a boundary. Uh, conformal fixed point, um, the two-point function in the bulk actually depends only on one cross ratio. Uh, in this case, it's not quite a boundary conformal field theory because of this logarithmic behavior, uh, but uh, yeah, so you know, if you, you, you don't have to sit exactly on the boundary to see this log. You can go some distance into the bulk, and then if you take the distance along the boundary to be large enough, you'll still see this log. Exactly, exactly, yeah. And uh, for a boundary conformal field theory, it actually, you know, depends on just one, one cross ratio. So it's conformal symmetry actually fixes it more than you would have thought just from scale invariance and rotation. Uh, well, so from various, okay, so, so let's say instead of, I'm, I'm going to explain later that um, the so-called fixed boundary condition, the normal boundary universality class, where you fix the direction of the boundary spin, that's kind of a seed for this extraordinary universality class. And in that case, this function is known from various epsilon and large n expansion and also from numerical conformal bootstrap. So we know something about it, but no, you know, not, uh, yeah, yeah? So below the green line, because the, the boundary is, is BKC, already have a finite boundary stiffness. That's right. So does, 
No, that, is there another similarity in the stiffness as I go through the orange line? Uh, exactly, actually. Well, we'll see later that the stiffness diverges logarithmically as you approach the extraordinary, uh, as you approach the bulk critical temperature. Yes? Is this correctly that you have just one boundary that is a semi-infinite system? Yeah, he, here I have a semi-infinite semi system, but you, you can, you know, numerically the way you study it, you always have two boundaries. Uh, and, uh, uh, it depends on kind of what the, what the scale. Uh, if, if you want to think about um, a kind of a, a slab of thickness t, you know, if you want to take the uh, width much bigger than t, then there is going to be a crossover to quasi two-dimensional behavior eventually. But if you study the slab kind of with aspect ratio of order one, then you are controlled by uh, this 3D boundary conformal field. So Francesco. Uh, who will talk after me, will show you a lot of nice uh, Monte Carlo data. Um, yeah, so speaking, speaking of which, uh, you know, the uh, more recent uh, n n numerics by Francesca Parizan Taldin and um, also by uh, Hu Deng and Lup uh, actually do, do confirm this, um, uh, this uh, behavior uh, along the extraordinary line for the XY. Model so and 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 even extract this exponent uh, of the log decay. Okay, so this is uh, the X Y model. So that's uh, already quite interesting, but uh, things become perhaps even more uh, surprising when you take uh, n greater than two. So say you want to look at the Heisenberg model. Well, uh, when n is greater than two, um, you know that above the bulk critical temperature. Uh, you always have a finite correlation length on the boundary. So you cannot have either long range or quasi long range order in a classical 2D system. So from the point of view of the topology of the phase diagram, it's completely consistent that you might have just one uh, boundary universality class, the ordinary boundary universality class for any value of the surface coupling K1. It's however also not ruled out by any fundamental law of physics that you could have two different boundary universality classes um, which connect to the same um, boundary phases above and below the bulk critical temperature. So which one of these two scenarios is realized? Well, if you look at the literature, I think people believe that just by kind of <laughs> minimalicity, uh, this uh, scenario on the, on the left uh, is realized. But, uh, Turns out that this is a situation where nature doesn't choose the most boring minimal scenario. Uh, turns out that uh, um, the answer depends on the value of n. So it turns out that if you take n to be large but finite, you are indeed in this uh, situation with just one boundary universality class. However, if you uh, treat n as a continuous variable and take it just above two dimensions, uh, then you are in the scenario here on the right, and you do have this uh, separate boundary universality class where, again, the spin-spin correlation function uh, decays logarithmically on the boundary. Now you might say, well, you know, this continuous n is some kind of theorist game. We are only interested in integer n. So here, you know, I cannot make um, really rigorous analytical statements, but there is a very convincing numerics by Francesca Presentaldin and others that demonstrate that uh, for the Heisenberg model, one is indeed in this, uh, in this regime and there is a separate uh, extraordinary universality class in the 3D Heisenberg model. Yes? It does, yes. I'll show you some, uh, some tables later. It is a boundary CFT. And, uh, well, so first of all, from Monte Carlo, Francesca has some estimate for the uh, scaling dimensions here. And, uh, yeah, from, um, from RG, one can kind of try to, try to estimate the scaling dimensions. Okay, so where do all of these uh, statements come from? Well, they come from a renormalization group analysis. And to set up this analysis, uh, we want to sit here at large value of the surface coupling 
when the surface has a very strong uh, tendency towards local ferromagnetic order. So then it's uh, reasonable to describe uh, the this, this surface layer by a nonlinear sigma model uh, with a small value of a bare coupling uh, G. So um, if the surface was completely isolated, if it was a purely two-dimensional system, we know what the fate of this uh, nonlinear sigma model is, right? So Polyhop has taught us a long time ago that the uh, coupling G uh, runs under a normalization group and in fact runs away to infinity. This is uh, taken as a signal of the development of a finite correlation length. So the main question is how is this uh, flow modified by the coupling to the critical bulk? So let's try to answer that question. So let's take our surface layer, which is described by the nonlinear sigma model, and couple it to the critical bulk. And you know, we can take some, let's say we take the ordinary boundary condition for the for the all the all the other layers, right? So it's kind of the second layer from the top has the ordinary boundary condition. And then we couple them together. And we want to study this model in the regime when the uh, bare coupling G uh, of the nonlinear sigma model is small. So the spin, um, the surface spin fluctuations are initially small. So let's begin with the regime when uh, G is taken to be strictly zero, right? So then the uh, surface order parameter is completely frozen. So let's take it just to point along the Z direction. Okay, so then, you know, it just acts like a boundary magnetic field, uh, a kind of an, an explicit symmetry breaking for the, for the boundary. And, uh, well, this coupling to the boundary magnetic field is relevant and the system flows to so-called normal universality class. So the normal universality class is the universality class which is again realized when you have an explicit symmetry breaking field on the boundary, and in this case, uh, you know, this normal universality class is believed to be realized for any value of the surface coupling K1. So again, this normal is some historical uh, terminology and we just stick, stick with it. Sorry, but wouldn't this mean that the boundary is just ordered? So, yes. Well, in, the, in this case, you explicitly break the symmetry on the boundary, right? So. Uh, there is going to be a finite expectation value of the boundary or the parameter in this case, but this is going to be just the starting point for our, for our analysis here. Later, we are going to take G to be small but finite and uh, try to understand where the system flows. So this is just kind of setting up. So there, it turns out that there is uh, some information that we know about this normal universality class. In particular, we know that there is a protected boundary operator which we call the tilt operator. In fact, turns out, well, first of all, I should say that this normal universality class is an honest to God uh, boundary conformal field theory, boundary conformal fixed point. And uh, turns out that anytime you have a bulk described by conformal field theory with some continuous symmetry, if you break the symmetry explicitly on the boundary, uh, then the uh, boundary operator spectrum will contain a protected operator known as the tilt, which simply corresponds to tilting the direction of your symmetry breaking field on the boundary. And this is going to be an exactly marginal uh, <clears throat> boundary operator. And one way to think about it is you take the bulk current corresponding to your continuous symmetry, in fact, corresponding to the generator, which is explicitly broken on the boundary. You take that bulk current, you consider its operator product expansion with the boundary, um, turns out that the leading term in this OPE is non-singular, uh, and it corresponds precisely to this tilt operator, and the operator product expansion coefficient turns out to play a very important role in our analysis uh, later. So please remember this, um, um, this OPE. Okay, so this is the normal boundary universality class, and turns out that for the ON model, this tilt operator is in fact the lowest uh, dimension operator in the normal universality class. So this is in fact the only non-irrelevant operator of the normal universality class. Okay, so this was the analysis when we froze the fluctuations of the, um, of the um, boundary or the parameter N, but now we'd like to switch back on the 
small fluctuations of n, so we parameterize n in this way in terms of the fluctuations pi. And well, clearly, these fluctuations will have to couple to the uh, boundary operators of the normal fixed point. And well, we, we saw that there is only one non irrelevant boundary operator, the tilt, and so the fluctuations have to couple to the tilt. And in fact, they couple in a very universal manner with the coefficient s here, which is exactly given by the operator product expansion coefficient at the normal fixed point. So one, one thing I should say is that, you know, the, we are starting with an action which is on invariant, but we are kind of using a description which is not manifestly on invariant. So on invariance is somewhere hidden, um, it must be restored kind of at every order in the fluctuations, and uh, at the leading order it's restored by taking this coupling to be given by the uh, OP coefficient. And the way to see that is, well, you know, if we just consider the normal action with the direction of the symmetry breaking field fixed along the Z direction, it's clearly not invariant under ON rotations. It transforms under ON rotation. And to understand the transformation law, well, you know that if you want to perform a symmetry transformation on any region of space, you just enclose that a region with a current, integrate the current uh, perpendicular to the boundary of that region. Uh, well, if you want to do symmetry transformation on the entirety of our semi-infinite space, well, just push the, this, uh, the boundary of this region to the physical boundary of our space, so you're going to get the integral of the current over the boundary. That's the transformation law of this part of the action under an ON rotation, and this term will exactly compensate this uh, variation of the action under an ON rotation. So that fixes the coefficient S here to be the same as the coefficient of the, in the OPE. So that's the, that's the derivation, and this kind of coupling is very universal, as you see. Okay, so now we have our action, um, right, described by the normal boundary condition, the nonlinear sigma model, and the coupling. And the important uh, observation is that there is only one free parameter in this uh, action, the uh, nonlinear sigma model coupling G. This coefficient S is fixed by ON symmetry, so it's not a free parameter. So then, you know, we can consider renormalization group flow for this uh, coefficient G, uh, and of course, there is a contribution from the nonlinear sigma model that we already know from Polikov, but there is going to be an extra contribution from this coupling to the tilt. And that contribution is actually very simple. It comes from this very simple diagram where the tilt is exchanged between the two uh, pi fluctuations. So that modifies the leading term in the beta function for the uh, coupling G. It gives you an extra contribution, and this extra contribution actually comes with an opposite sign to the strictly two-dimensional contribution, so it has a chance to switch the sign of your beta function. And I should say that the anomalous dimension of the boundary or the parameter n to this order in uh, the coupling constant is the same as in pure uh, two-dimensional system. Yes, Liv? So TI, TI, it's a... From the box. It's this protected operator at the normal fixed point um, and the only thing that we need to know about it at this order is that it has dimension 2. So its two-point function is exactly 1 over x to the fourth. And that's the only... Is it, a, is it an operator that comes from, from the box that you take to the circle? That's one way to think about it. But you, you can think about it as, well, here we have the normal action. So normal action is an action for the critical ON model in semi-infinite geometry with a fixed boundary condition where on the boundary the spin points along the Z direction. Uh, and in that, you know, in that action there is a boundary operator which we call the tilt with dimension exactly equal to 2. So th that's the tilt. That we can think of that operator as corresponding to variation of the direction of the uh, symmetry breaking field on the boundary. Yeah. So, you know, in principle, this operator will have some non-trivial four-point function, six-point function, uh, but <laughs> to this order in the calculation in G, we only need its two-point function. 
and this coefficient s, which comes from the, which is again some property of this normal fixed point, right? So, so this bulk to boundary OP is some property of the normal fixed point and um, is set, right? So, but once we know this parameter s, then to this order we got the beta function for the, um, no, for, for, for the coupled theory, for the fluctuating theory. Okay, so what's the physics? Well, uh, the physics will depend on the sign of this, of the beta function. So, uh, in general, okay, so first of all, uh, if alpha is positive, right, then this g will run to zero logarithmically in the infrared, so it flows to weak, the, the nonlinear sigma model flows to weak coupling, everything becomes controlled, and I can calculate the two-point function of the uh, surface um, spin, surface order parameter, and because of this RG flow of the coupling constant and because of the anomalous dimension that has a linear contribution in G, if I integrate the cullen semantic equation, I get a two-point function that at large distances behaves precisely in this manner with an exponent which is determined by alpha. So this is exactly this extraordinary log fixed point that I, or extraordinary log universality class that uh, I've advertised in the beginning of my talk. On the other hand, if alpha is negative, then the g equals zero fixed point is unstable. The, uh, the system runs away uh, to some other universality class, and we'll, we'll discuss where it runs away in a second. Okay, so is alpha positive or negative? Well, that depends uh, on n. So first of all, when n is equal to two, then there is no purely two-dimensional contribution to the beta function. Uh, the contribution only comes from this coupling to the tilt, and this contribution is uh, explicitly positive. So for n equal to two, we have the stable extraordinary log universality class. That's good because we knew that for n equal to two, just by the topology of the phase diagram, we needed an extraordinary uh, universality class. Here we learned that it's of this logarithmic character. On the other hand, for large n, you know, you can use large n expansion to analyze this normal uh, universality class. You can compute this OP coefficient s, and you find that alpha is negative. Uh, so for large n, this extraordinary log universality class is not present. Okay, so we see that alpha changes sign uh, as a function of n, and the minimal assumption, which is uh, corroborated by numerical bootstrap, is that it uh, changes sign just one critical value nc. And we don't know, uh, you know, from analytical calculations, we don't know the precise value of nc, but uh, Monte Carlo, uh, I think, very clearly demonstrates that nc is greater than three, and from numerical bootstrap, uh, it seems that nc is close to five. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the phase diagram, and, uh, you know, that's about, about all that I can uh, say based on analytical arguments. So now numerics uh, comes comes in, and um, well, Francesca will tell you much more about this uh, in the following talk. But basically, you know, the, the surface behavior in the regime of large surface coupling has been analyzed with Monte Carlo, and for both n equal to two and n equal three, uh, the everything appears consistent with this extraordinary log universality class, and the parameter alpha has been extracted. Uh, okay, that's, that's with questions, or? Sorry, that, that, that's with questions, so that's without? Uh, this is before questions. Okay, okay. So, um, and the parameter alpha has been uh, extracted, and, um, right. Uh, so that's the value for n equal to two and three. Um, remember I told you that the theory tells you that there is another way to extract this alpha. It's related to this OP coefficient of the normal universality class, that is uh, the boundary in the presence of a symmetry breaking field. So Francesca has also studied that problem and extracted this bulk to boundary OP coefficient. And, okay, here is the value from the normal universality class, and you see that it agrees with what you extract just by simulating 
the boundary without any symmetry breaking field. So that's a very non-trivial check of the, of the theory. And finally, uh, we can again do numerical uh, conformal bootstrap calculations uh, on the normal universality class to extract this uh, OP coefficient S. And you know, this is not this high quality bootstrap uh, that people use for bulk uh, correlation functions. It doesn't have the same degree of control, but nevertheless, it's so-called truncated bootstrap. But uh, nevertheless, we get numbers which are in reasonable agreement with Monte Carlo, and uh, we see that alpha uh, goes negative around n equal to five. So we think that the critical value of n is equal to five. So let me uh, acknowledge my collaborators on the bootstrap project here. Uh, all the hard work was done by Jay Podayasi, who is a graduate student of Ilya Grusberg at Ohio State on his way to a postdoc uh, at the University of Florida in Tallahassee next year. Uh, we got a lot of help from Marco Maneri, who is an expert on um, boundary critical behavior, and Abhi Krishnan is my uh, PhD student at MIT. Okay, so, you know, I told you about the theory for this uh, boundary criticality in the ON model uh, seems to be in good agreement with numerical experiments, but what about, you know, realization in the lab? Well, so first of all, I should say that uh, it has been claimed in the literature that the ordinary boundary universality class of the uh, O3, you know, Heisenberg model has been, um, has been observed uh, in experiments on nickel and gadolinium paramagnets, and actually even the boundary um, scaling dimension has been, has been extracted. So the question is whether we can also realize the extraordinary log universality class, and this requires two conditions. So first of all, the boundary exchange coupling has to, again, you know, this just talking about classical classical paramagnets, right? Just query points at finite temperature, not, not some quantum critical point. So uh, this requires the boundary uh, exchange coupling to be about a factor of two larger than the bulk coupling. And perhaps, you know, if the bulk interactions are uh, somewhat frustrated, then the frustration can be uh, relieved on the surface uh, and um, that can lead, lead to this effective uh, condition. The other, um, the other condition uh, that you need is that you need very weak spin orbit coupling, right? Because spin orbit coupling will just pin your order parameter direction at this extraordinary log um, fixed point. Okay, so there's uh, been other suggestions for realizing this extraordinary log um, universality class uh, now at a, in a quantum critical point in a quantum hole bilayer. This is work by Yahoo Zhang and uh, Ashwin. Uh, so I, I won't talk about this in detail, but um, it seems that as, as you go to this um, excitonic um, um, condensate phase from the uh, quantum hole um, bilayer phase, the edge naturally realizes the extraordinary log universality class. Okay, so I'm running out of time, but uh, you know, let me very quickly <laughs> uh, tell you about the, some of the more recent developments. So, you know, in addition to studying um, the boundary in the ON model, you can study a plane defect. And here, it uh, turns out that you have this extraordinary universality class realized for any value of n. So there is no critical value uh, of n. It's realized all the way up to n equal infinity. So uh, in this case, you know, large n gives us control. So this kind of a analytical um, um, setting where you can show that the extraordinary log universality class really exists for arbitrary large integer n. You don't have to rely on uh, taking n to be continuous. Uh, and, you know, one way that has been discussed to, um, re to realize such a plane defect uh, is um, if you take a two-dimensional quantum critical point um, and uh, subject the wave function to weak measurement or decoherence uh, as uh, Chao Ming and uh, Chenke and Zhongyong have uh, shown, this effectively mapped to this uh, 
plane defect in the space-time uh, path integral. Okay, so you now we started by asking this question, if you have a critical bulk uh, and you know, this uh, bulk has a continuous symmetry, can the symmetry be spontaneously broken on the surface? For the ON model, we explicitly demonstrated that the answer is no. You know, you only get this very slow fall-off, uh, logarithmic fall-off. But you can ask more generally, you know, if the bulk critical system um, is some general conformal field theory, can the surface develop long-range order? And uh, there was this very nice work by Gabriel Coma and Shu Yu Zhang uh, that showed that uh, under some reasonable assumptions, uh, the answer is, is no, actually. And in fact, this extraordinary log behavior is as close as you can get to long-range order. Okay, so I'm at my, basically at my conclusion slide. So, you know, in this talk, I mostly focused on the classical ON model. Um, now, there are quantum analogs that have been studied extensively with numerics, uh, critical points of two plus one dimensional um, quantum spin systems that actually in the bulk just map to the O3 three-dimensional um, universality class, classical uh, universality class, but uh, some very uh, unusual behavior is seen uh, on the edge of these uh, systems when they tune to criticality, and I would say that we still don't, don't fully understand um, these uh, this, uh, lattice models. Um, I mostly, again, talked about uh, you know, two-dimensional defects, either boundary or two-dimensional uh, bulk defect, uh, but you know, one can apply some of the same ideas to, um, to study uh, impurities, so zero plus one-dimensional defects in uh, space-time, and uh, this was done with a O3 model with a large spin uh, defect um, by Gabriel Coma and collaborators. And actually, uh, very recently with uh, my student Abi, we've uh, revisited the Conda model, and actually you can understand the weak to strong coupling crossover in the large spin limit using some of the same technology that I developed, um, that I developed here. And finally, uh, another um, one-dimensional line defect problem that we, we are studying uh, is just um, trying to bootstrap uh, line defects, and we are focusing on the 3D easing uh, model. And this is work that was actually started almost a year to date here with uh, Ryan Lanzetta, who is a graduate student uh, in Seattle, and Shang Lu, who is a postdoc here. So we have some, some exciting uh, bootstrap results uh, that we hope to write up fairly soon. All right, so I think I'm running out of time, but let me stop here and take questions. Thank you. Maybe one or two questions. Suppose I was interested instead in the disordered problem with a finite density of these defects, you know, in random places. And suppose that, you know, this, this thing was Harris relevant on top of my pure fixed point. You know, does, you know, the, the, the universality class of what happens on one defect say anything about what one expects at the disordered fixed point? So, well, first of all, it's, I don't know how you would realize kind of plain defects. All, all across your system. M many plain defects like this. Uh, but, in ran but in random places. In random places. Y well, so generically, right, the answer is no. The single, the universality class of a single defect doesn't tell you much about uh, the, dis the, the problem with many defects. Although, you know, like the condo lattice model, right, the fact that you have uh, the, the condo screening cloud for a single impurity. I mean, that doesn't form the physics of the uh, condo lattice model in some regime, but you know, the details are, uh, it's not so easy to go directly. Okay. Is it true that the S does not flow on the RG, and how to see that? How to see that S doesn't flow on yeah. the RG? Well, it's fixed by the ON symmetry, right? So it cannot flow. That's the reason. Yeah, hello? How uh, one over n minus one over alpha. 
I, I think I showed that. Uh, yeah, here. Uh, I think I think, I think so. Okay, one well, one last question. <laughs> um, is it possible that having multiple defects in the bulk could drive a bulk phase transition? Uh, well, if if they are, you know, if if there if, if there is an extensive number of them, or at least if that number scales with L, then yes.